just probably you could spot the start in is like from your point of view, this is obviously a unique situation for sport and sports athletes and stuff like that. And with no tournaments on the horizon and a very uncertain period, uh, how are you helping your guys get through this? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that um, I'm still seeing the Reds kickers. There, there's six of them, uh, principal kickers. Uh, so one or two quite young. Uh, and then the other four, well, certainly three are in the first team or will be in the first team. And one's in the Wallaby squad. Um, we just look at it as an opportunity to get better than you were before. And, and, and often in a rugby environment, there isn't the time. It's, it's quite funny rugby because it took Sexton probably four years to become Johnny Sexton that you know him, right. but you've got no idea of what it was like at the beginning okay. and, and, and how we used to have to scrap for training time and all of this sort of thing. Then you become established and you can decide you know, when you're going to train, all the rest of it, the same as Wilkinson. The problem that you have in all these organizations is nobody knows how to grow one. You can get one and spend a huge amount of money for them, right? And they arrive and they'll arrive with how to, pla how to train and all the rest of it. But nobody seems to be able to create an environment in a normal club environment to develop your own. So that's what I'm trying to do with the Reds and use this sort of stand down as a golden opportunity for the players. Now, whether the coaches begin to understand it or not is another story. But for the players to start to appreciate what it takes to be world class in numbers, in time, and all the rest of it. It doesn't mean to say that you kick for hours and hours and hours and kick your legs off. You have to be very, very specific about exactly what you're working with. And, and ironically, I'm doing exactly the same with Bowden Barrett, because I did a couple of sessions with him before the lockdown. So I'm doing the same with him and just gradually building up. And he's suddenly getting the realization and, and loving it um, that you know, I do this, we have this thing called reverse repair. And the principle of this is that we all know that um, it's process versus outcome in, in, in anything you do, okay? And in goal kicking, it's the same thing. You get process and the ball goes over the post. So yeah, here's your process, get the process right, you get the outcome. But reverse repair okay, is about the flight. So now you have to change the repair. In other words, you adopt, you start adapting your repair to get the correct flight. So what it does is the flight starts coaching you to get it right. Now there's a great, you know, a lot of people believe that if you get the technique absolutely perfectly right, then the ball will go straight. And I don't agree with it. I do not agree with it. It's like, you know, the perfect golf swing. Mm -hmm. There's not necessarily the perfect ball strike gets the ball to go straight, yeah. but that's not always the result of a perfect swing. Yeah, very so good. I've used yeah. that in kicking. Wow. So we do, we've got four kicks. We've got uh, running spirals, uh, drop shunts, which is like a drop kick on the run. Um, and drop punts. So for example, the spiral, it has to spiral and it has to reverse. So if you imagine I kick to you and as it's spinning that way, it eventually will turn the corner. So it can either go dead straight or it can slightly turn the corner. And if it doesn't, that doesn't count. So I'm now being held to account by the ball flight. So although I've kind of taught them all the basics that the, that the fine tuning is actually about feel and the strike. And only the player knows because you can't feel for the player. You know, I, I can judge it and say, well, you know, you got hold of that one well and so on, but 
The bottom line is they will manipulate it, albeit subconsciously, by feel. So that's the reverse repair. So you've, there's the outcome. Right, now you work out how to produce it. It's not quite as crude as that, but that's, that's the principle. Because most people, it's process versus outcome. Let's work, 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 work on the process and the outcome will come. And I'm going, well, no, not necessarily. Yeah. You work so far and if part of the outcome is the flight, so for example, with goal kicking, it has to be an absolute upright flight and the ball has to go straight. No curve, no draw or anything, it has to go straight. And you'd be amazed how players, once they reach a certain competency by the number of reps, and I mean, they kick three times a week for like one and a half hours each, and then they go and do their own stuff as well. So, they, you know, it's a lot of kicking, but then just go back and look at Rob Andrew and Johnny Wilkinson and Paul Grayson and have a look at how much work they did. So, and how much Sexton's done over the years. So. Um, and they're beginning now, the penny's beginning to drop. And, and Bowden, I cannot, you know, often people say, you know, what's the difference between all, an all black and, um, you know, why is he an all black? I can tell you why. I can't actually describe it, but I can feel it. Right. Just like an and intensity you would just there. Go, go ahead. Just like an intensity there or... It's a yeah, sense of when you're being around Yeah, just just doing it. Like conversations we have, you know, every time you have a conversation, he make no, makes notes. We said, I've got a couple of things I want to ask you from yesterday's session. What about this? What about this? And I explain it. He writes it down, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes sense, right? Okay. Boom. Off he goes. And then um, he, he sends me the videos. So he does six kicks of each one. So he sets the video up and I get a video of six kicks, six spirals with the right foot, six spirals with the left foot, six drop shunts, six drop, and so on. And so it goes on. It's interesting what you said about the, uh, the reverse repair because we see that all the time. Like I've gone to like, been at, like tour events and especially one of the most interesting ones is like challenge tour events where you'll see all these guys on the range swinging it like like swinging a beautifully like amazing golf swing but yet yeah, none of them are making the step up to the to be world class or to the next level and i think you probably hit the nail on the head where they have all the positions but they may not have the skill which is the ability to create the outcome but, it, it, but it's it, it's not a question of skill it's an awareness and the the reason why most coaches don't like it is if i ask you because i've created this way of measuring the strike and I ask you to measure the feel, I've given you control, haven't I? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You, you, so I have this thing called energy league. So if you're gonna hit a ball, uh, let's just say we're, let's just keep it two dimensional at the moment. So let's say we're hitting a three wood off the tee, okay? So you hit the three wood off the tee, and I'm gonna say to you, okay, right, did all the energy go through the ball? And, you're, and, and, and straight away, that's suddenly, oh, oh what, what do you mean? I said, well, if it didn't go, if you didn't hit it absolutely sweet, which variable was it? Which side? In other words, did you kind of wrap it round the back? So that would be a plus. Or was it a little bit of a leak? That would be a minus. And if you got it absolutely right, that would be zero. Now, if you suddenly ask somebody to hit balls and say, right, give me a zero energy leak, you watch the difference. But you have surrendered the assessment of the athlete to the athlete. Yeah, and a lot of coaches don't like giving away that control. They like to have the track man that gives me the smash factor. Well, even the smash factor doesn't tell you. You know, it's too blunt. I mean, I can understand. It's just a formula, basically. Yeah. yeah. But if you start then getting players to suddenly that, okay, what was the strike like? And where it is particularly relevant. So if you've got a side-to-side -side variant, say with your three wood or rescue or whatever, when you're chipping, you've got a vertical variant. 
because with chipping, you know, you either nip it beautifully or it's a fraction thin, so that would be a minus, or you'd hit the ground slightly, just scuff the ground a little bit heavy, that would be a plus. And you get somebody to suddenly go, oh, oh, now try and get a zero, it completely changes it. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, I mean, I, I use it with the, with, the, uh, with the kickers, but I also use it with Francesco as well. Right. And how, how have you dealt with, um, you know, you're saying about the strike, a lot of the time, I was, I was saying this conversation to Donald there the other day was, I have players who hit the ball really well, would hit a six iron to 30 feet, 25 feet, and immediately turn back and say, the strike was great, but the swing was shit. That's a problem that I, I really agree, don't but like. Why you, how can you, right, okay, so th it might be shit if you've got a blueprint of what a strike should be, a swing should be, but I don't agree with that. Neither do I, no, I, honestly, I, I, don't agree. I mean, there's a, there's a mate of mine in Australia who is a, a, a who is a golf coach who drowns people with enthusiasm, okay? And, and he just says, you know, the ball doesn't give a fuck about the backswing. It doesn't matter. And you look at the great golfers, it's their ability to manipulate and get the strike right. I mean, if somebody says to me, you know, you, that's an awesome strike. And if you think of the physics of the strike, it is probably, I would say 12 inches before and six inches afterwards, depending on the velocity. Yes. Okay. Yeah. After that, doesn't matter a toss. Yeah. And, and if the body moves and you've got a truncated sort of bump on it, you know, like Tommy Fleetwood hasn't done badly, has he? No. You, you look yep. at his swing and you, you say, oh, terrible. It's truncated. It stops. But, man, he hits the ball brilliantly. You spoke, you spoke about their, the, the, uh, like the strike or whatever. And I would always talk to players. Like, I talk about mental maps. So I want them to have like a mental map of the shot that they're trying to hit. Whether like if it's a putt, it's like I want it to start here. I want you know, the trajectory to look like this. I want it to go into the hole at yeah. the speed. If it's a, 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 like a full shot, it might be have this amount of curve, start here, finish here. Would you use the same plus minus system? say in terms of curve, trajectory? No, no, what I would do, I would actually have it slightly separate. I wouldn't worry particularly, because if you wanted, let's just say, for the sake of argument, you want a kind of a, and also it depends obviously very, very subtly on the ball position related to where you are. So if you want a higher shot, you're gonna put the ball position, most players, good players, have it just ever so slightly forward. Okay, so they sort of come at it and you, you leave the, the face open and then roll it over, you know, so you'll do all that manipulation. But what I would do it, I just spend some time with them. Okay, let's just hit the ball dead straight for less half a dozen shots. Let's get the feel right. Because if you think about it, an, a, a high fade is a, like a minus minus a half energy leak. But if it's intentional, that's fine. Okay. Do, do you see what I'm getting? So, and this is where if you go full circle into the sort of the coaching philosophy of mine is that actually there's no such thing as a mistake. The only thing is when something doesn't match its intention. So I don't agree with mistakes. I, do, you know, people say, oh, I fucked up that. Or, you know, like you just said, you know, strike was good, but the swing was shit. You know, I'm going to say, well, okay, so what did you intend to do with the swing? I don't, I, I ban those. I ban subjective assessment because it doesn't help at all. If you say, right, okay, the swing, you took it a little bit on the inside, but you were able to correct it, well done. Mm -hmm. Now see if you can take it a little bit further on the outside and try and keep the club on the outside. Try and do that differently so that you're more likely to get a more consistent strike if, if that actually works. Gotcha. So I, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's really, really important. <laughs> you have a fundamental baseline that actually we don't have mistakes. We, we have degrees of matching intention. 
Okay. Now, just... already, that suddenly puts a big emphasis on the player, doesn't it? Big time, yeah. And I think you, oh, yeah. Have, you, you touched on, you kind of touched on language there, um, Dave, and like how you use language and players to um, change, shift perspectives and, and, and change modes of thinking. And I'd be really interested to hear when you start working with a player, especially an established player, that maybe like it's like a tour player or whatever, or, or, or an all black, how long does it take for your influence and guidance to really shift their patterns of thinking in terms of the language they use surrounding how they practice? It, how they it, play? it often depends on, on, on the humility and eagerness of the player to understand what I'm doing and then buy into it. Once they buy into it, you know, like for example, you know, a uh, like great conversation with Bowden Barrett, all right? Okay, uh, he's doing the running spirals and basically what, what's tending to happen is he sometimes just leans back a little bit so he has to lunge at the ball, all right? I mean, it's very, very subtle, you see. And, I, and, I, and he sent me the video and I showed him, I said, look, on the, the middle two kicks there, you just sat back a fraction. I said, and I think it's because when you place the ball, you, 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 you're kind of leaving it out a little bit. So he said to me, oh, okay, so I, I shouldn't lean back. I said, you're right, but now let's work out what you're going to do differently. Because you can't not do something. Right, gotcha. And I wish coaches would realize that. Because I wish I had a pound for every time I heard a coach say, don't do that, don't take it on the inside, don't drop that, you know, blah, 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 so on. The brain doesn't work on deletions. So we ended up discussing, okay, so what do we need to do? We need to get over the impact. Let's think of something that's going to make it impossible to do what we're trying to avoid. So rather than, you know, not do something, do some, and it came down to hold the ball a bit fatter, so spiral a bit fatter, let the ball go a little bit lower and try to get your body over the impact. So you're not you pointing see? out the problem, so, you're pointing out the solution first. Yeah, all the time, all the time. And, there, and, and the problem is only a variable. You know, he just put the yeah. ball a little bit too far forward. Yeah. And then eventually he had to do something different to get the kick away. Right. So I'm just saying, well, okay, well, you know, and then he says straight away. So there he is, right, sit down, stay forward. And it's really important that players, when you're trying to change something, you know, that they, they work on what they're trying to do, not what they're trying to avoid. And I see people on the range, you know, people got gizmos, they've got ball in their hands, they, what am I doing? Well, I'm trying not to do. I'm going, oh, fuck, you know, tell me what you're trying to do, not what you're trying not to do. And, and golf, sadly, for whatever reason, is, is shrouded in pretty negative people, I believe. Most golf clubs are not welcoming. You, you know, you look at a young player keen to be played, you, you're lucky if you get a really good golf club, a young coach who's keen, you know, the old pro that runs the pro shop and all the rest of it can't be asked with young kids helping. He just wants the old bloke who's going to pay him 50 quid and the subs and all the rest of it. The, the golf business is not naturally welcoming. It's funny as well. Like, and I think, like, you, um, sorry? You, you go into a golf club and you see, let's, say, let's imagine there's a table to the right and it's full of nine-year-olds and they're after playing nine holes and they're like, oh my God, did you see the shot it hit on seven? It went right off, it landed on the green and rolled to this and then another kid's going, and did you see that putt I made on nine? It went in from like 30 feet. And then on the left-hand side, you've got a table of like 50-year-old guys and they're like, oh, I should have had 30 points, but I three-putted the last four holes and I hit it in the water on seven. Oh, that's, yeah, that's so right. That, that is so right. And you know what I would do, just be really pissy. I'd say, right, you've got five minutes on your own. Okay, so just tell each other what you did. Okay, right. Okay, gentlemen, I want half of you over there joining with the kids. Kids, can you go and tell the gentleman what you did? <laughs> I would, I'd, would, I'd go straight in there. You tell him about that 14 foot putt. You know, I don't give a shit about the six, six inches you missed. Tell him. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's it's unbelievable. And like it's unbelievable how, especially in golf, we see it so much that our, our, the, the positivity of our language just goes like as we get older. Well, I tell you what, you want to do honestly. I, there's a the golf club that I play at at, at home, wherever whenever I'm ever going to get you know to get back there, but. Um, is uh, the players in, in Tockington. It's, quite, it's a good track. They played, um, they played the Jamaica Tour on there. I think they played a couple of um, Challenge Tour events on, anyway. So it's a, good, it's a good track, okay? And they have, every now and again, they have a, what they call the Silver Slavo, which is where they set all the holes at pro level, okay? Right. And it's completely open and everybody plays it. And it's, got, it's a good day, it's a, it's a good day, right? On the back of the card, it's sponsored by the fucking Samaritans. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Honestly. I think that's smart. <laughs> I know, but it doesn't that tell you. Brilliant, isn't it? When somebody starts moaning, you can just go tell the back of the card. Yeah, I know. And the, and the other thing is, I don't know if you've noticed, is if you, if you ever want an education in positive affirmation, just go into a golf club on the monthly medal day and watch people and ask people how they got on. And the first thing is always, oh, don't ask. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, and I'm just thinking, well, why, why do you go like that? And, and, when, and, and one of the problems that they have is you've got the youngsters absolutely buzzing about what they can do and they ignore what they can't do. And then somewhere in that shift to the older people, we're now in a state of negative avoidance. So we're not concerned about achieving, we're concerned about not making mistakes. So the whole demeanor and the way you look at things is completely changed. And I think, you know, that's, that's where golf shoots itself in the foot. And sadly, most golf coaches don't make a stand to try and shake the player out of that. Yeah. They go down with him. Yeah. They indulge them, especially like as they get better, you indulge them more and more because of their... Oh, no. It's even worse then. Hello. It's it's worse. You see them on tour and you see them on the driving range and you... You just look at them and they're, they're not laughing. They, you just, it's just, you know, and I think it's worse when the guy's just got his card or he's got, I don't know, let's say six invites a season. You know, this is the big opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's really, really important with any sport is sport is only part of a journey. And the sun will always come up tomorrow whether you make the cut or not, okay? And right here, right now, all we're doing is having an opportunity to see how good we are. And I've chosen those words on purpose, all right? And whatever happens, we'll look at it. And the question I'm gonna ask you on the Monday, if, if that's okay, is if you had that time again, what would you do differently? That's all. And then I'd ask, what did you do well and why? And with this, uh, would, would, would your words ever change depending on how a player may be doing? Like using like Molinari, for an example, he had a great year working with you over the last year or uh, yeah. the year before that, the 18 months. And he's, he's struggled a little bit since, since maybe the Masters. And yeah, the yeah. way you approach that differently? No, because there's always, um, you know, I, I, look, I don't look at a form. I just look at reason. And reason is he's ch trying to change the swing. Uh, he's, he's got himself slightly injured. Um, so it's full on rehab and so on at the moment. So this is the blessing in disguise. And I lean on him as the same as they do every, every other time. Okay. Uh, you know, what are we going to get better than? And I've got all the data that I keep from practices. So when we turn up for practice again, okay, right, let's just try this. Okay, so let's just go in, let's just play the wedge work around the, we'll go five holes playing five shots per wedge. Okay, this was the data we achieved last year in the Centurion. So let's just see how much we can chip into that as a starting point. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's great. 
and uh, you know, but, but most people don't record don't record practice i know